Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. A mindset. We need to have the right framework for our life. And that comes by the truth of God, which is revealed ultimately through His Word, but through the illumination of the Holy Spirit. We're going to be looking at a passage of Scripture tonight that is rich in wisdom, in insight, in relevancy for our walk with God. And he's going to be speaking, I'm speaking of the Apostle Paul. He is going to be speaking about the assurance we have because we have received the Spirit, the living Spirit of God through our faith in the Son of God, Messiah Yeshua. Well, with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to 2 Corinthians and chapter 1. 2 Corinthians and chapter 1. Now, Paul is writing here to a congregation that is located in a city of sin. It is a city that is full of licentiousness. It is highly immoral. There is an emphasis on the sensual rather than on the spiritual, on the fleshly instead of those things that relate to to God. And we're going to see how Paul concludes this first chapter, the one that we began last week. We're going to see how Paul demonstrates when he writes how he approaches his life. That he does not make decisions rashly or frivolously, but he brings them under the authority of God for the purpose, the outcome that will be a delight for God. So before we open up the scripture, ask yourself, do I want to have a powerful testimony, one that is rooted in an objective, which is to bring glory to God? If that's not your objective to bring glory to God, then then you have not believed or understood the gospel. We are going to see how grace needs to be utilized in our life. Not just for eternal life, but the life that we live now in this body until Messiah, he receives us unto himself. In my view, this second half of chapter 1 is a most informing passage that can change your life. So let's begin. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, we're going to begin in verse 12. We read here, for our boasting. Now, most people, we hear that word boasting and we think you ought not boast. This is not good. It's rooted in pride. But, but here, we need to understand it, not in a prideful boasting, but in exalting, exaltation of Paul for God and God's faithfulness in his life and what God is doing in his life through Paul's ministry to other people. And he's speaking not just personally, but also for those who are with him. And he's going to speak about Timothy, Sivanus, and others who serve with Paul for the objective of doing the will of God. So he says... For our boasting, most Bibles will say, is this. But literally, the word order is flipped. It doesn't say, is this, but this, it is. And what it's trying to do here is to accentuate. That is to exalt in order to put an emphasis 
upon how important this is. So literally, for our boasting, this it is. The testimony of our conscience. Now, let me just stop and say how important the conscience is. And every human being, all of humanity, God has placed a conscience in that person. Why? Well, I believe God is is sovereign. That means God can do whatever. But he only does those things that are in keeping with his character. God never does something that violates who he is. And God defines the standards. Now, let's just depart for a moment on a very brief theological lesson. Now, we know that everything God does is righteous, but it's not that God did it in order to fulfill some standard of righteousness. It is because God is righteous that what he does defines righteous. So God, who he is in and of himself, he defines what is holy, what is good, what is righteous. God doesn't meet these standards. He sets the standards. Now, does he meet them? Obviously, what he does is good. What he does is righteous. What he does is holy. But it's very important. He defines them. So when we look at the scripture, we read the testimony of our conscience. God, as I said, has given everyone a conscience. And God is free to speak to anyone, those who are saved and those who are not saved, through that person's conscience. God can communicate. If he's sovereign, he can communicate with those who are lost and said dead spiritually. God is able to speak to them. Meaning this, someone who is an unbeliever, they can read scripture and say, this is true. They can fall under conviction. God can work, speak, address them, move through that conscience. And that's why people need to understand that we are lost in sin, but the depravity, total depravity, meaning this. I am unable to understand anything from God. God is unable. To me, this is an attack on his sovereignty. But there are those who teach that God is unable to speak to someone unless first that person is regenerated, becomes a new creation. Then God is able to share the gospel. And because he's that new creation, he must, he has to accept it. This is not what we find in the scripture. God is able to communicate with believers, as in this case, but also with non-believers through the conscience. He's able to reveal truth. He speaks to people through the conscience. So he says, our conscience, the testimony of it, What we know to be true, God affirms this within us, that in holiness and sincerity. Now, both of these words, holiness and sincerity, they are modified with the word feu, which is of God. So it's the holiness of God and the sincerity of God. Their testimony, what they're doing, God bears witness to them in regard to holiness and sincerity. And not what they do is not based upon, notice what he says, not in fleshly wisdom. That's not how they're behaving. But rather, it says, in the grace of God. Let's talk for a moment about God's grace. God's grace saves God's grace brings about salvation. God's grace enables me to enter in, not based upon my works, but his grace, to enter into the kingdom of God. Most every believer would affirm that. But here's the problem. God's grace is even greater. Because God's grace, biblically speaking, is is connected to the will of God. 
So yes, I am saved by grace. I am forgiven by, by God's grace. And I'll be in his kingdom by his grace. He gets all the praise, the glory, and honor. But also that grace that regenerates me. Now, having been regenerated, you know what I'm interested in? I'm interested in the will of God. In fact, one of the motivations for a true believer is that they want to turn away from sin. That's what repentance is. They want to turn away from sin and embrace the will of God. That's why the, the proclaiming of God's grace that saves, that gives us assurance, that gives us a promise that cannot be altered of eternal life, that great news of assurance does not cause a true believer to say, well, in light of that, I'm going to go out and sin. A true believer does not want to exploit God's grace, misappropriate it for those things that are against his will. Now, at times, do we stumble? We do. Do we sin? We do. But it's against our new nature. It's against the true desires that we have. We can be deceived, we can err, we can sin, we can stumble. But a true believer, they're not going to find joy in that. They're going to recognize it for what it is, and that's sin. No, a true believer, what's going to be the motivation of their life is the will of God. Walking in it, demonstrating it, teaching it. And that's why he says, our, our conscience bears witness that, that in the holiness of God and the sincerity or with the sincerity of God, not with the, the wisdom of, of the flesh, but rather in or with the grace of God. We behave, we acted in the world and even more so, all the more so, with you. So Paul is saying, we have a, a testimony. Our conscience bears witness that we act in holiness and in sincerity. What type of holiness and sincerity? That which belongs to God. Not in fleshly wisdom. And he says, we have behaved in this way to all people. But, but even more so, meaning he has invested a great deal in this congregation at Corinth in a place of perversion, unrighteousness. He wanted this congregation to have a powerful testimony in this location. Verse 13. For we do not write other meaning we don't write other things to you except that which you have read and that which you understand. Now, what I would say in regard to that is this. If you, if me, if we would just put into action what we already know, maybe what we've learned the first six months after coming to faith, if we really put all those things into action, we would be so different, so more powerful for the things of God. The problem is that we don't act in what we've read and what we have understood even. We need to take hold of that. And he's saying here, be very, very clear on what Paul's writing. He says, for, for we are not writing other things to you, but, but what you have read, and the implication is previously, and what you have understood. And I hope. Now, Paul uses a conjunction here that in this case means even more so. I hope not just in those things, but even more so what you have understood, what you have read, that you just don't understand them now, but you'll continue in them. Notice what he writes. But I hope that also until the end, that you will 
understand them, meaning that you'll understand and implement them, what you understand, into your behavior until the end. Now, one of the questions that we should ask is, what end is he referring to? Well, in the next verse, there's a very, very important term. We'll come to that in a moment, but let's see what, what, what Paul writes in verse, verse 14, the second part. He says, just as you know us in part. Now, what does he mean? Just as you know us in part. Well, they understand the motivation of Paul. They know Paul and Timothy and Silas, but right now they only know in part compared to what they will know about them in the future. What future? In the kingdom of God. And he goes on in this same verse and says, because we are your boasting. Meaning this. Now all of this, remember he's spoken of the end the end of the body of believers, the congregation of redeemed, the ecclesia of the church in this world. When does that happen? When's the end? Our blessed hope, our rapture. And at that time, those believers in Corinth, they're going to understand in the fullness what Paul, Timothy, Sivanos, what they imparted to them. Right now, they only understand that in part. But then they are going to be boasting, exalting God for the ministry they've received from these men. That's why they say here, just as you know us in part, that we are your boasting, even as also you are ours. What does Paul mean here? When you minister to someone, bless them, disciple them, lead them to salvation. There is going to be an eternal effect. The Bible says God is not unjust to forget, so that means he remembers all of our deeds. And those individuals, what they have done, Paul, Timothy, having led this congregation into its existence, sharing the gospel, leading them to faith, Paul is saying, we, based upon what you have done with your salvation experience, we are going to be thankful, we are going to be exalting God because of you as well. Until when? Notice how it ends. In the day of our Lord, Yeshua. Now, what day are they speaking of? Well, I've already alluded to that. It is a reference to our blessed hope or the rapture. We need to understand there's two very significant terms. One is the day of the Lord. One is simply that the day of the Lord, it's speaking about God pouring out his judgment, his wrath on the world to consume and punish. Not for the purpose of repentance, not for the purpose of discipline, training, but for destruction. But the day of Messiah, the day of Christ, or the day of the Lord Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, it appears in different uh, terms, but it's referring to the day that's related to the Messiah. And that is a reference to, and it appears, that phrase appears around six times in the Scripture. In 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, and I believe four times, in, in Paul's epistle to the Philippians. So he writes here about the day of Messiah, when we are going to receive the rewards, the outcome of our faith and our faithfulness, what we have believed and how we have demonstrated our faith, how we have demonstrated and done what we have professed. Verse 15. Now Paul is going to reveal to us, teach us about how he approaches life. And he says here, look at verse 15. And this confidence, it's a word of security. 
Paul is speaking about the confidence, the, the certainty, the assurance. Now, if you listen to me much, you will know that I put a great emphasis upon that term, assurance. God does not reveal things to us so that we're in doubt, that we don't know. No, he reveals that we might know and that we have assurance of what he has said. We'll be more specific about that in a moment. But he writes, and for this confidence, this assurance, I wanted, and this is word to purpose, he intended, he was planning to come to you. Now, what's interesting is the word order is unique. He says, I was planning to you to come. And the emphasis is, it's not the journey, but it's the purpose of the journey. And what was that purpose? Those people in Corinth, those who he's writing to. So he says, to you to come. And he desired to do that previously, even before now, that a second time a gift you would have. Now, that word gift is also related to the word grace. And what he's speaking here is this, that he would come and speak more about the grace of God. See, we, we just don't mention grace and, and summarize it in a few moments. The grace of God is full. It's powerful. It is a word that speaks about much of God's plans and purposes. So he says, I had purpose. I had the intent. I wanted to you to come previously in order a second time that, that grace you would have. And through, look at verse 16, and through you, meaning to come to you and to pass through you into Macedonia. And again, from Macedonia to come to you. So he said, my plan, I had arranged this, that I would come to you. After visiting you, I would go on into Macedonia. And from Macedonia, again, I would come to you. So he's talking about returning again to you, and underneath. Now, it's the word hupo, and it means underneath. And he's speaking, he's planning a trip, and one day we, we looked, or we would look at a map in order to plan a trip. And underneath Greece and Macedonia is Judah, the land of Israel. So he says, I had purpose to do this, to visit you, go to Macedonia, come back to you, and go underneath you to, notice, Judah. And what was he going to Judah to do? Well, what's the capital of Judah? Jerusalem. Most scholars see that Paul's saying, I'm going to do ministry. And that is going to, in the end, I'm going to go to Jerusalem to worship God. Why? Because Paul recognizes any good work that he does, it is God through him. God gets all the praise, and therefore, when good things happen through you in the life of other people, praise God. It is his spirit using you, working through you, and sometimes even in spite of us, in order to bring about that which is pleasing, that which delights God. So, so Paul wants to go to Judah to worship. Verse 17, therefore, this I was planning, not something, therefore, with the exercise of lightheadedness or frivolity. Now, this is a word which means to give little thought to. To, to make a decision without considering everything that's, that surrounds it and revolves or is involved with it. So Paul says, I was purposing to come to you. But, but I made that decision not with a lightheadedness or what I planned. I did not plan it according to the flesh in order that from me, he said, I gave it. I didn't do it that way with, with lightheadedness, with frivolity, 
but rather he says i planned it not according to the flesh in order that from me the yes would be yes or the no no now we're going to see an expression an idiom in that culture in this language they would sometimes say yes and no. Oftentimes you hear politicians, right? They are asked a question, they go, yes and no. They're trying to say everything, please everyone, and accomplish everything without doing anything. Paul says, this is not my heart. This is not how I speak. I do not say yes, no, so that, well, you have no certainty. I haven't said anything with clarity. Paul says, this is not how I make decisions. I make decisions not according to the flesh, not with a light head, but, he says, I make them in order that my yes is really yes or my no is really no. Verse 18. But God is faithful. He's speaking about the faithful God because our word, God's faithful to reveal. That's why he says about God's faithfulness. It revealed to him what he should do. So he says, therefore, because God is faithful, our word to you did not come about yes and no, meaning uncertainty. I'd like to do it. I'm not sure. I'm planning to. I want to. I'm going to come, but none of that. Paul was very, very dogmatic. There was clarity, assurance. He spoke, and what he said, because it came from God, God who is faithful, to lead, guide, direct, give wisdom, to give insight. Paul says, because God is faithful, our word to you did not come about yes, no, meaning with uncertainty. Verse 19. For, you want to know what's certain? For the Son of God, Yeshua HaMashiach, Messiah Yeshua, the one who is among you. Now, how did the Yeshua in this very wicked city, how did Yeshua become among them? He says, through us, he was proclaimed. First and foremost, Paul is saying what we came to do was to proclaim Messiah, to proclaim who Messiah is, Yeshua, that is, Jesus of Nazareth. He says, through us, he was proclaimed, through me and Silvanos and Timothy. It did not become, he says, it was not yes and no. There was nothing uncertain. didn't happen. It did not come about yes and no, but... Yes, in him, it was, is, and will be. Now, I need to unpack that because there's a very unique Greek word, gegonin. What he's saying here is this. We preached Messiah. Messiah is not yes, no, uncertainty, but, but with Messiah. And it's very important that we see the prepositions that he's using here. Now, sometimes in English, we see a Greek preposition and we translate it one way. We'll see a different Greek preposition and we'll translate it the same way when there's a significant nuance of difference. And this is exactly what's going to happen here. So I would implore you to, to really pay attention because this is significant. The Word of God wants to reveal something to us. So he says... In Messiah Yeshua, what we proclaim, him among you, it did not come about, yes and no, with uncertainty, but yes, in him. And then we have a word, gegonin. What is gegonin? The root is genomai. And it means to happen, to come, to be. It's a very, very frequent word that has many different meanings. It usually speaks about something taking place, a happening, an event, something coming into being. But he uses here a very important tense, the perfect tense. 
which speaks about something that was in the past. And because it was in the past, it has relevance. It accomplished something. And that relevance, what it accomplished, what it brought about, is also relevant happening in the present. And also, that same relevance, what is happening, what it brought about, the outcome is going to continue into the future. So he says here, in Messiah, in him, what an important phrase, in him, there is certainty. There is clarity. And not only that, there is yes. Now, yes to what? Well, he's going to tell us exactly what he's speaking about as we press on. Look now to verse 20. Verse 20, there's a very important term. It's the term promise. But not just any promise. I can make you promises. I may have the best intention. I may make a promise and all of my heart, my being wants to fulfill that, to keep that promise. But in the end, I may not be able to. I may have promised something that I can't deliver or something has happened that I was able to, I intended to, but now, no fault of mine. I didn't see it coming. It's not anything that I could control, but in the end, I can't keep my promise. That can happen to a human being. It never happens to God. What God promises, he always, always can deliver. That's why that important concept, assurance. He has promised eternal life, and he, he can deliver eternal life. We have a covenant promise from him. So look at verse 24, and literally the word gar is always the second word in the verse or in the sentence or in the, the phrase. Even though it's the second word in a, a sentence, it has to be translated first. So for, but the really first word is a word here which means as many to the degree, to the extent. And what is this word modifying? What's it in relationship to? Promises, but not just any promises. Notice what it says. For as much as the promises of God. So he's speaking specifically about what God has promised to the extent of what God has said, what he has promised. In him, hear that. In him, this promise is yes. But notice, in him. If you're not in him, if you don't have a covenant or relationship with him, if you are not in his character, in him relates to character. If you're not in Messiah, these promises, although God's made them, although he's able to deliver them out, we are not going to be receiving. Why? God does not reward disobedience. Our disobedience can cancel out or delay or hinder the promises of God being a reality. So he says here, verse, verse 20, for to the extent the promises of God, in him they are yes, and in him, amen. Now, what does that mean? The word amen means you can believe it, you can trust it. It's related to the word truth. But here's the key. Now, in this case, we're talking about God's workmanship in regard to the Holy Spirit. And he says here that his promises are yes, they are true in him. But notice what it says. For God, his glory. When I am operating in the mindset that what I'm doing is for the glory of God, then, then we can be assured that God's promises are going to be experienced very carefully. For to the extent the promises of God in him, they are, yes, 
and in him they are what? True. Amen. Believe them. For God, for the glory, his glory, the glory of God through us. So when I am operated, when the motivation of my life is his glory, that is bringing me into a position where I will receive the promises of God. But if my objective is not the glory of God, then I'm not going to be in the place to receive, to take hold of the promises of God. God's promises are still there. They are, are factual, but I'm not going to be located or have the means to take hold of them. Verse 21. Now, when we are in him, when we are walking in his truth for the objective of his glory, notice that the Holy Spirit is going to work in our life. It says, but the one who makes us steadfast, who edifies, who builds up, who, who strengthens. Now, it's a word which means to establish, but to establish steadfast, unmovable. So the one who builds us up with you, those in Corinthians, they share this experience. It's not unique to Paul and just a handful of, of leaders or apostles. He says, the one who establishes us with you, and here's the key, for Messiah. Now, why is this so important? Well, Many Bibles will translate it in Christ. But we have to see something. When we look at the text, it says in, in this scripture, it says, in him, in him, but here we have a different word. It is not the Greek word, en. Sounds very similar to in, and we get the word in from this word en. But this is a new word when it says, not in Christ, but it's Ace Christos. What's that? For Messiah. For Him. So we need to be individuals that have as our objective the things we do. There's not some selfish motivation. It is not about us, but it's about Him. When I behave to, to bring about God's glory, and I do so for Messiah, in my covenantal relationship with him, that's my objective. Then we are going to experience God saying yes. Not yes, no, not no, but yes to his promises. And not only that, he says, and he anointed us who did God. So God anointed us when we are for Messiah. We experience that anointing. Verse 22, and by the way, he's not speaking about being filled with the Spirit, being indwelt with the Spirit. He's talking about an anointing that comes for the equipping, the providing, the provision of doing his will. Now, verse 22. Not only did God anoint us, not only does he build us up, establish us steadfastly, but it says, and also he sealed us and gave to, meaning gave to us, who? The guarantee, the earnest. And who's he speaking about here? The spirit in our hearts. Now, we know that we have been redeemed. We have been born again, that we have been saved, that we'll be in the kingdom of God because we have received that, that earnest, that guarantee. And who is that? He is the Holy Spirit. So everyone who has the indwelling spirit, see, I, as a believer, have the indwelling spirit. That does not necessarily mean that I'm experiencing the anointing of the spirit in a given situation. But he's talking now not about the anointing, but the fact. And he uses a word which means like a down payment. It shows sincerity. It, it gives evidence of. And if God says, Here's proof. Here's a, an act that shows that I'm going to carry out what I began. You can believe that. 
And therefore, everyone and only a true believer has the indwelling Holy Spirit dwelling in our hearts. And what does that mean? Heart, we should always see that as being related to our mind, how we think. Verse 23. But I, I call upon my soul. Now, what he's doing here is saying, this is serious. Paul is saying, I call of myself. And what's he calling for? He says, the testimony of God. Some will say that he's saying and he's calling upon himself that he is a witness for God. He is a witness for God. But now he's testifying. And he's saying, God bears witness with me in this. And what's his testimony now? Well, keep reading. Middle of verse 23. That I spared you that would no longer come to Corinth. Now why? Remember what he says. He says earlier on, I made a decision. I had purpose to come to you and to do this journey. But I did not do it according to fleshly wisdom. I did not do it with lightheartedness, with frivolity. But he says, I did it how? Thinking about the promises of God, having been established, being one who is under the leadership, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So he says, I bear witness, and God testifies with this, that I thought to spare you, that no longer would I come to Corinth, not at least at this time. Why? He says, not that we, speaking of Timothy and Silvanos and others, that we would not lord over your faith. He's saying something. You are a believer. You don't need necessarily us coming and, and ruling over you, lording over you, because you have faith. You have what he just spoke of, the indwelling spirit. Paul was someone who believed greatly in the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer, to bring about change, to mature the believer. So he's saying, you don't need that I should come, we should come to you and lord over you in your faith. He says, but we are, he says, fellow workers, joint workers of your joy. His motivation is that they would have the joy of the Lord. But hear this, the joy of the Lord comes by, comes by what? The joy of the Lord comes through working together with other believers for the purposes of God, for the glory of God, and for the will of God to be realized. When that is your life, you know what you're going to be? You're going to be in a position, in a location, where the promises of God are readily there to take hold of. The second half of this first chapter of 2 Corinthians is a powerful chapter that can impact your life and your walk and your understanding in order that you become a faithful, a well-pleasing, a delight to the living God. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.